Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite again your presence as we open your word together, as we study together. We know, Lord, that uh, there is many things happening in this world today that we have no control over. But you have foreseen all these things, Lord, and we leave our, our lives in your hands. And we ask, Lord, that as you lead your people, that we can uh, continue to understand your word. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So I sent out, uh, to those who are on my email list, I sent out the 1998 uh, newsletters um, from Future News or Future for America at that time. Now, we're going to be going into the Sunday Law a little bit more. And uh, the reason I sent them out is we're going to look occasionally at some of them. Here you can see this is August 1998. And... Uh, the main article there by Jeff is called Sunday's Coming with three exclamation marks. And that seems to be the focus of Jeff's ministry prior to 9-11. And, and, and what we see as we look at this history is that Jeff, like many Seventh-day Adventists at that time, is looking for the coming Sunday law. And they're looking at uh, the events that are happening, the statements by the different churches, the different types of meetings that are happening, uh, you know, the things that the Pope is saying, the Pope's letter, uh, letters and, and things like that, his, his uh, official documents. And, and they're trying to glean when that Sunday law is coming. And this was really common in Adventism in the 1990s, um, especially after Joe, Pope John Paul had, had come to, uh, to become the Pope in, in the 80s. Uh, there was this expectation that a Sunday law was coming. And so when we had the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989, and the Pope being extremely involved in that, um, what they are expecting, what Seventh-day Adventists are expecting, is that the Sunday law is imminent. And so Jeff is, is part of that, that movement in Adventism. The main difference with Jeff is he has a, uh, a prophetic application of the fall of the Soviet Union um, based on Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45 and then an understanding of the Sunday law unfolding after that event so that's that's his main premise and you can see why many Adventists are accepting what Jeff is saying in the 1990s there's you know he has a lot of support he can go to uh, places around the world and speak about the coming Sunday law, and people are going to be interested in hearing what he has to say. The change that happens in this movement later uh, with 9-11 and then the view of Islam um, alienates some people. Now, another issue with... Question. Yeah. When did Jeff speak in an SDA church last? Does anybody know? I don't know. That's that's a, a good question. Um, I know that he he spoke with Adventists. Um, they did they did a series, I believe, in Oklahoma, some kind of uh, um, what was that called? It wasn't a seminar. It was a convention or something like that, and. Uh, different people spoke on Daniel chapter 11, if I remember correctly. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Jeff has mentioned. Yeah, that was the, when he met with the, um, that guy Hardy from Andrews, okay. or was that another group he met with? I don't know. I, 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 I've only heard Jeff mention it in passing. So at that time, he still, as far as the Adventist church was concerned, there would still be, you know, he wasn't like some offshoot. He was somebody that at least they had to uh, contend with, you know, even if they had a difference of opinion. So, um, 
That was Frank Hardy from Andrews University. Yeah, so what year would that have been? Oh boy, I can't remember at all. Two thousand and eight, two thousand nine, maybe. Yeah, that's kind of what I think is. It was around that time, because when we, because the first I came into the message was two thousand and ten, and that was at the Oklahoma camp meeting, and so it had been before that, you know, a couple of years uh, before that, and I think that's one of the reasons why they they rented. Um, that health center in Oklahoma, because I think they had had used it before. At least that's the impression I have. Um, so, um, but anyway, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows the last time he spoke in an Adventist church. Um, well, do you know much about his, where did he go to church um, prior to, um, when did he ever go to church in Arkansas? I know. Yeah, he went to the Hot Springs Church a few times and he mentioned once he went to other places, but he um, his name became infamous quickly. And so they gave up uh, not long after re arriving in Arkansas. So they weren't going to church at all in Arkansas then? I, I think very little, just a little bit when they first moved there. And, and that was about it. And when he was disfellowshipped, he had actually had his membership with the conference. Because it was the conference that disfellowshipped him, not some local church. So, yeah, anyway, it's a good question. Just, just ask Jeff, maybe he can, maybe he remembers. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody has contact with Jeff at all, so. <clears throat> Um, so anyway, uh, why did I switch? What did I do here? Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to go to notebook number one. That's the one. I wanted. Okay. Now, as far as, so this issue, um, where I was going to go next. So we have this Sunday law issue. Now this comes from his understanding of Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45. Now, Uriah Smith has a different view, and Uriah Smith's view is basically the pioneer's view. That's the Millerite view, but with modifications. So Jeff had studied um, Lewis F. Weir, and, and you know we've mentioned Lewis F. Weir. We we've looked at a couple of his quotes here, um, but Lewis F. Weir writes extensively on the understanding of Daniel eleven verse forty to forty five. Um, rejects Uriah Smith's view and, and gives us some good documentation how the, that uh, James White had a different view. What, what Lewis F. Weir didn't seem to understand and Jeff didn't seem to understand and, and, and we didn't understand until recently is that Litch had a very similar view. Um, and, and from reading Lewis F. Weir, I'd come to the conclusion that this view of Uriah Smith's was sort of his own. Uh, this interpretation, uh, because that's the impression Lewis F. Weir had. So he hadn't read Lich's interpretation and didn't seem to know, um, at least that's my impression. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe he knew that there was some connection. But he seems to think that the pioneer view uh, is James White's view. Um, so maybe it's just an assumption of Lewis F. Weir's and, and a lack of access to a lot of the documentation now that we can easily get. Um, now, uh, Dwight, before we had this meeting, he was talking about doing some research in to seeing how Uriah Smith's thought process went by um, articles that he had written prior to uh, the book, Daniel and Revelation. And um, what was the particular point that you were bringing out there, Dwight, uh, prior to this? Well, the what, what I was looking at first came, came from understanding an overview of Uriah Smith's history at that time. Because before he published 
the what became the book on thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. He did a series of Sabbath school classes in Battle Creek, then presented this in writing in the Review and Herald, and then presented these in books, first thoughts on the Revelation and then thoughts on Daniel. Yeah. Now, as we as we look at the portion that you have up on in front of the screen right now. Yeah. Um, Jeff quotes the great controversy, page 605 to 606. Yeah. Then he goes to <clears throat> Daniel 1141, that he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So he goes to use the Strong's reference, glorious, mm -hmm. in the sense of prominence, splendor as conspicuous, beautiful, goodly, and he lets us know that this came from Strong. Mm -hmm. Then he goes in to quote, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed. Right. Now, Jeff then interjects, Uriah Smith describes the previous verse. After putting an end to the war, Pompey demolished the walls of Jerusalem, transferred several cities from the jurisdiction of Judea to that of Syria, and imposed tribute on the Jews. For the first time, Jerusalem was by conquest placed in the hands of Rome. That power was to hold the glorious land in its iron grasp until it had utterly consumed it. Daniel and Revelation 247. Now I recognize Theodore that you, you have read this several times, <clears throat> but from the verbiage that Jeff interjected here, where he states, <clears throat> Uriah Smith describes the previous verse. There are two verses. So which one is, is he referring to? Does anybody have an opinion? Well, I don't know. Just looking at this, I can't tell. Okay. That's why I went back to, to his review and Herald article in 1871. And it was interesting to me that what Smith is referring to here is Daniel 11.16. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I'm just looking. Now, the thing that, that has separated Smith from Lich and from many of the other pioneers mm -hmm. has been his complete dependence upon the commentaries of others to give his view its credence. Right. He 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 uses the the opinions of man to sort of bolster his arguments. Correct. <clears throat> now, Lich and others were attempting to provide a counterpoint to several of the, the items that William Miller was presenting at that time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what Smith did is he took those counterpoints and chose to build on them additionally with other commentaries. Some mm -hmm. of what some of what he wrote in this in the actual article on Daniel eleven sixteen is giving reference to how this is the first 
entrance of Rome into the situation. Yeah. But when when he's gone back further in his history, this portion with with Pompey is substantially after the initial contact between the children of Israel and Rome. Yeah, this is 63 AD. Right. So we're we're talking about this being what 99 years after the um, the initial contact. Well, well, we normally put it at 158. Okay. My fault. Bad math this morning. Yeah. So 95 years. Okay. So. <clears throat> I also, I'm also intrigued because as we place this, according to the chart, Smith sets aside the chart and wishes to place this at a different date. Yeah. So the entering in of the glorious land, you shall stand in the glorious land, don't you stand before him. Um, you're saying that we should place this in 158? Well, okay. We have the 1843 chart, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the first contact is 158. That's okay. the league with the Romans. And in 161, uh, well, so, so in 161, they did actually have a league with the Romans. That's three years before that. But uh, the, the league really doesn't go into effect until 158. Right. So, um, so, I mean, they do have contact with the Romans prior to 158. We know that in 161, they, they do make a league. But that league really isn't, it's, it's a precursor to what happens in 158. Now, there's differences of opinions about this as well. But we still take the date 158 as the league with the Romans. So that's when, uh, and that's where the 666 years by uh, that Miller uses that come to 508. So that's the 666 years for pagan Rome. So Smith departs from that view, of course. Yep. <clears throat> now, As Jeff continued through this, he uses a quote from Deuteronomy. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is, that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain, and Lebanon. And this is, is this not Moses that is praying this? Yeah. Okay, now, he segues into the next portion to say, William Miller included the con conviction of the United States having a divine purpose in his statement, which describes why he was led to his understanding that sparked the Millerite movement. And when we go to page 13, for just a brief moment, in 1813, I received a captain's commission in the US service and continued in the army until peace was declared. While there, many occurrences served to weaken my confidence in the correctness of theatistical principles. I was led frequently to compare this country to the children of Israel, before whom God drove out the inhabitants of their land. It seemed to me that the Supreme Being must have watched over the interest of this country in an especial manner and delivered us from the hands of our enemies. I was particularly impressed with this view when I was in the Battle of Plattsburgh, when with 1,500 regulars and about 4,000 volunteers, we defeated the British, who were 15,000 strong. Now, I'm going to stop here for just a moment. Mm -hmm. The last presentation that I put before the body 
also dealt with the Battle of Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, with what, with what Jeff is presenting here, is the date for the Battle of Plattsburgh being lined up with Daniel 1116? You're, you're asking if that is how Jeff is doing it? No, I'm, I'm asking if this is how the Lord has done it. And that whereas we're looking at this right now, can we make that comparison? Well, well I think we can. Um, you know, I mean, because for those that don't remember, September 11th, 1814, the date that the Battle of Plattsburgh happens. And the note, the notable significance of that is it's um, 187 years prior to what date? September 11, 2001. 11, 2001. So you have that 187 years between those two events. So you have the symbol of July 18. And um, so, you know, so just on that part, we, we, we're connecting this Battle of Plattsburgh with September 11th. And the question is, what is September 11th a symbol of? Or how could we apply September 11th? Can we connect it to Daniel 11, verse 16? Because no. it's a glorious land, right? Right. Um, that, is, in a sense, is under siege. Um, with Pompeii and then defeated. Did that happen with the United States in, in some way at September 11th? Can we make a comparison between that? Even though that's not how we typically would think of it. We would think that Islam came in to protect God's people. Right. Well, my, as, as we have addressed in other ways, September 11th, was also the the date that the the Seventh Day Adventist Church accepted spiritual formation as a point of training for its teachers, administrators, and those that that would work for the conference. Yeah. So <clears throat> September 11, 1814, the colonists repelled the then most fearsome army in history, that of the British. Yeah. But September 11, 2001, God's chosen church chose to accept spiritual formation as a method of training its leaders. Yeah. So it, it basically laid down to the Catholic Church. Yeah. Because the, the spiritual well, formation is basically just St. Ignatius is of Loyola's spiritual exercises. Right. Now on the on the other part of this, as we were addressing from the chart that you had used, Stephen's chart that you'd used in the week of Christ presentation. Yeah. From 419 AD mm -hmm. to 538 AD, we have a period of 119 years. But 419 lays the groundwork for the dogma of papal infallibility. That after 538, becomes one of the major tenets of the Roman church. Mm -hmm. So that 119 years, if we take it and reverse it, again becomes 9-11. Yeah. Or if we express it in the European way, it's the 11th day of the ninth month. So we have 9-11 that's come up several times. 
we are tying this into different portions with history of what is going on currently within the church. So when I'm looking at this and I'm reading through this, as I do believe that Jeff was inspired by our Heavenly Father and by his angel, I'm asking if Daniel 11:16 could possibly be equated with 9-11. And if that is the case, then can we use this as a waymark in the rest of our study of this book? Hmm. Well, there's still lots of things I have to think about because you're just looking at the one as aspect of 9-11 dealing with the church. But we also have Islam attacking the United States. Now, of course. So one of the things that's interesting um, here, I'm just going to go to book notebook number three here. Okay. Uh, so I'm sort of looking ahead of uh, uh, something that I wanted to study later. But in notebook number three, if I can find it here. Uh, it's not there, it's over here. Um, Jeff addresses, which, which I mentioned last, you know, last time in the introduction is that there's this uh, study on the three woes and the seven trumpets. So Jeff makes a statement. Um, have to search. I don't know why. I don't know where it is. <laughs> okay. And I believe it's supposed to be on page 106. So let me see. different uh, file than what I was used to. Um, different version of notebook six. Okay, so this is on the Sunday law in the United States. And, and it's under the context of the first woe or fifth trumpet and then uh, he's going to talk about, so just, just to go back and give a bit of background here. Um, he says, uh, the first war, the fifth trumpet is Arabic Islam, a power of the bottomless pit, sudden and violent in nature, a prolonged war between East and West culminating with the battle of Nineveh was the key and uh, key to and preceded their rise to power. They were to torment and hurt the beast that was Eastern pagan Rome and the beast that is papal Rome for five months, 150 years, beginning with the Battle of Nicomedia, July 27th, 1299. This began the Ottoman Empire, Turkish Islam. They were not to hurt those who had the seal of God. Um, uh, they had a king over them, who's the angel of the bottomless pit, a destroyer both in Hebrew and Greek. Uh, so this is really a, a summary. These are kind of like notes that he, that's obviously his notebook. The first woe concludes when the last emperor of Eastern Rome, John Pallad, it's not spelled right, um, left his throne to his son, Constantine. Constantine refused to accept the throne without permission of the Tur Turkish power, which when he received, he then ascended to the throne in 1449. In May, 1453, Constantinople falls. So then he talks about the Sunday law in the U.S. And he's going to quote Daniel 11, verse 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. And, and then he says, Islam, a power from the bottomless pit, sudden and violent in nature, 
After a prolonged war between atheism and Catholicism, Islam begins its warfare again. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Ishmael. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Genesis 16, 11, and 12. Then Jeff says, and this is in the year 2000, so this isn't after 9-11, this is before. Modern radical Islam will torment and hurt the beast that was the USA through sudden and violent actions with the emphasis on modern, modern gunpowder. It will also hurt and torment the beast that is, which at this point is coming together into the threefold union of modern Babylon, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the United Nations, the New World Order. Circumstances created by radical Islam will provide the environment politically, economically, socially, and religiously to pass a Sunday law in the USA. At this point, the sealing of God's people begins. So in this context here, Jeff is looking at the Sunday law, but he's also seen that Islam has a role, um, which, you know, and you read the context, you read the language, you can see that this is pre-9-11. Um, one is he's looking at when this happens at, in the future, that that's going to mark the point of the sealing of God's people. So he's looking at it as a future event, not as something that has happened. Um, and um, that it's going to lead to this Sunday law. So it's going to provide the environment. So prior to 9-11, he already sees that Islam has this role. So if we go back to uh, what you're talking about here, and we're, we're thinking about 9-11 in connection with uh, what happened in the Battle of Plattsburgh, um, the War of 1812, what role does it play prophetically? It further establishes the United States as being a two-horned power worthy of note on the world stage. Right, because the United States, I mean, they've already separated from the British, um, you know, for that. But um, now what, 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 um, and I'm not, I don't remember this, um, but why did the War of 1812 occur? What was happening then? Because the British had not chosen to accept that the colonies were actually able to exist on their own. They wanted to retake yeah. what they saw as being theirs. Yeah, well, what, so there was no particular event that caused them to do this. It was just something the British decided to do. Um, well, the British, the British were something to do with Canada. Well, there there were points dealing with Canada. There was also, you know, kind of a, a simmering feud because they were afraid that America could come to the aid of Napoleon, just as Lafayette had come to the aid of America. Okay, so so it had to do with Napoleon. What was happening in France? Right. Now, Napoleon dies when? Um, well, Waterloo 19, occurred, I believe, about 1813, 1814. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, because it's around that time that Napoleon dies. 1815 is Waterloo. 18? Yeah, that's what I was thinking was 1815. And then I think Napoleon lives another six years after that. He's um, banished to St. Helena. Yeah, he died. He died fifth of May, eighteen twenty-one. Yeah, but it's in eighteen fifteen that he's. That's when he ends his. When he's banished. Yeah, banished. Yeah, and so yeah, so we have Napoleon happening there, um, which the British are concerned about, and we also have Canada. Uh, Canada at that time is uh, still not a country. It's still part of the British Empire. 
because it's not till 1867 that Canada becomes a dominion. Um, let's all, let, let's yeah. also recall that uh, there was there was quite a stir that came up after the Louisiana Purchase under Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think the British might also be concerned that the Americans would want Canada. Right. Now, um, now somebody had mentioned something about, um, and I can't remember what the context was, but dealing with how many people supported um, I can't remember which battle it was, but it was just, uh, maybe it was Daniel Fontenot who brought it up. Something like 3% or something. Uh, anybody know what I'm oh, talking about? I brought it up. You brought it up? What was that about? Well, it's, it's a realization of the colonists that chose to fight for American independence. Only 3% of them actually stood as part of a militia or army to battle the British. So we don't know what percentage of the population supported independence, but only 3% showed up to fight the British. Correct. I, I believe it was about that, that you had just over 51% that were supporting the moved to independence because there were quite a few sympathizers, quite a few crown sympathizers at that time. Yeah, and, and that would be the case, you know, uh, you know, obviously in Canada, it's not part of the United States. Um, you know, so, you know, many of the sympathizers would have gone to Canada as time went on. But uh, there must have been you know, there, I mean, because we think of it as America being America, but I mean, they're they're a British colony, just as as uh, Upper and Lower Canada are at that time, right? So when they become independent, um, they then form into the United States of America. But you know, there's not really this distinction between Canada and the United States at that time when they when they become uh, United States. Upper and Lower Canada could have joined with the United States if they had wanted to, but they chose not to. And I think a lot of that would have been uh, because Lower Canada is um, mostly uh, Catholic. And, and actually there's, even though there was a lot of Protestants in Upper Canada, because you have a lot of Scotsmen and, and so forth, um, there just wasn't the I mean, because, you know, we think of them as separate countries now, but at one time they really were just all British colonies. Right, you know, history has kind of divided them. You understand what I'm saying? So, yes. So, so the separation that happened then, uh, that, would, that would have also been something that uh, the British would have been concerned about. Would the Americans take over? you know, upper Canada, probably not lower Canada, but. So, so I, I, that may be part of it is that the Canadians may have wanted that war as well, seeing the United States as a threat. But anyway, um, prophetically, if we're gonna try to understand this history, um, what, how would we place this war of 1812? I mean. We don't necessarily have a direct prophecy in the Bible regarding the War of 1812. But how could we lay it down as a parallel? Because we are connecting it now with 9-11. As a, a comment in the chat just placed, okay. that a primary cause of the war was Royal Navy stopping American ships on the open sea and seizing men they claim to be either British born or deserters from British vessels, even if they claim to be American citizens. By some estimates from 1793 and 1812, over 15,000 Americans were forced into British service in this way. Okay. Now, one point 
to also consider. Mm -hmm. Fairly early on, you have the American military, fledgling as it was, that was going to war with Islam. Now, one of the points that could be offered for consideration, and this would be a point that Brother Daniel would be most keen on, yeah, was the involvement of not just the American military, but the Marine Corps in the initial battle against Islam. For those that are familiar with the Marine Corps hymn, it begins from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We will fight our country's battles on the land or on the sea. Now, the shores of Tripoli, we're referring to a battle that took place between an outnumbered group of United States Marines and a much larger contingent of Mohammedans. Right, and which year was that? What was that? What year was that? I believe it was 1803. Okay. Yeah, because that's what I was I was trying to look up here is these battles. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so um, and that would be part of the first Barbary War. Yes. Okay. Because that starts in 1801 to 1805. Uh, also known as the Triple Tripolation War and the Barbary Coast Coast War, according to Wikipedia. So this, so this, that, was, there's this battle against Islam right at the beginning of the United States. Right. Okay. Now, the point that had been occurring at that at at that period of history was the sultans were demanding ransom to allow the American ships to trade or to pass in that area. And the, the basically the, the attitude that was being expressed by the administration at that time is we will pay no ransom. Mm -hmm. Now, I was intrigued because if, if you take a good look at this, you will find that here the king of the, the, the future army of the king of the north comes up against Islam. Mm -hmm. But what was surprising to me was also to note in this period before 1840 that you also have two instances of the king of the south coming up against Islam. One, because the French came up against Islam, and two, that the Russians came up against Islam as well. Mm -hmm. So it helped me to understand that Islam cannot be the king of the south. Yeah. In the same manner, it also helped me to understand that Islam cannot be the king of the north. Right, and that's and that's the thing that you see happening with um, interpretations of Daniel eleven verse forty to forty five. Now, is that some some are sort of sticking to Uriah Smith's view. So, so you're going to have Turkey or Islam as the king of the north. But other people trying to put it as the king of the south. And and both, of course, are incorrect. Right. Because that's not the role of Islam. No. 
the role of Islam is to protect God's people. Yeah. Now, here we stand with the with against what Smith was presenting, because there are many points where he wishes to agree with the chart, agree with Daniel 2, agree with Daniel 7, and Daniel 8 to a point, but then he wishes to say that there is a new power to be introduced. And when, when he's noting the new power of Rome, that's an agreement with the book of Daniel. But when he starts to address that Islam is and remains the king of the north, mm -hmm. then he's going off from what is in scripture because he's more reliant upon the commentators. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with looking at the commentators and trying to get information, but he becomes really dependent on that as his main defense, I guess, is that the commentators make these statements. So he takes them as an authority to some degree. But, but this introduces, you know, a problem, maybe not a problem, but um, a complexity to the situation. Because when you look at the Battle of Plattsburgh, we can parallel it in some ways with what happened on, no, on, no, on September 11th, right? And, and yet there are some characteristics of it. Uh, one is the characteristic of, if you want to look at it this way, you could look at it as a battle between the King of the North and the King of the South. Not, not in, in those players, but just all of the battles between the North and the South have this symbolism in them. And, um, you know, we think of this as the British, of course, but the British are coming, you know, one is through, um, you know, sea, so they have ships, but also from Canada. So we know that Canada is involved. So that's, that's North of the United States. And you have the Americans here winning a battle where they're strongly outnumbered which reminds us of the Battle of Raffia in, in that sense, correct? No disagreement. Yeah, so, and, and there are things that we have already used to parallel this to September 11th. One is the great slaughter that Miller speaks of. So in some ways, this battle is typical of, of what happened at 9-11. Now, 9-11, you have Islam attacking the United States. Well, Islam is not the king of the South, right? You know, in, in the prophetic symbols of that. But if you look at it in the context of America is, it's the armies of the king of the North and it's going to be not defeated, but definitely it's gonna have um, this battle, so to speak, between the United States and Islam. But of course, that's to protect God's people about from the coming Sunday law. So this is this is God allowing this event to happen as a warning to God's people. So what this does is it 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 introduces sort of a complexity when we start looking at <coughs> the Battle of Plattsburgh as connected to 9/11. We have to be careful in how we're connecting it um, because you know part of the thing that has happened within this movement is that there are some uh, who are you know, following the Millerites message using Uriah Smith's understanding. And, and then they, they take the Battle of Plattsburgh um, because the first I ever heard of this connection of the Battle of Plattsburgh with 9-11 was actually um, um, Frost. Um, what's his first name? Don. Don Frost. Right. And, and so he looks at, at, at this history, and that was the first I'd heard of it, um, which, you know, I probably should have heard of it some other time, but I heard of it from Don Frost back in 2015 or something like that. Um, so, 
you know, so this issue of trying to understand what it is we're looking at prophetically, I think we have to be careful about. Um, but what we can see, I think what we can see is that this is about the coming Sunday law. And how would we then parallel? Because what, what's Jeff doing here when he's looking at, you know, the impending Sunday law? He's really just trying to address the issue of what the glorious land is, right? That would be, that would be his argument here. He's trying to say, okay, what is the glorious land? The United States is the glorious land. And he's quoting here from William Miller, uh, because at the Battle of Plattsburgh, what William Miller sees is that somehow the Amer America is this nation that God has, has, has his hand over, right? So he can see that America has a prophetic significance and that doesn't fit in with the idea of being a deist. So he sees this as a miracle, and that leads him to believe in God, that God is interested in us, and to study Bible prophecy. So, so that's, the, that's the point that Jeff is making. But we can now see that this has a connection to 9-11. To and so the question is, what is that connection, and how does that relate to the coming Sunday law? So if we go back to the statement I read from notebook three, where Jeff is looking at what Islam, the role Islam is going to have. And, and Jeff isn't, at this time, I don't think he's really aware of what, what is happening in 1812, some of the things we just discussed. He's not thinking about the battle of Tripoli. Um, he's not trying to understand the role of Islam here. He's looking at about, he's thinking about the Sunday law. But we would have to say, that um, the role of Islam in protecting God's people from the Sunday law or, or hindering that Sunday law, um, is, that, is that somehow typified in what happens in the War of 1812 at the Battle of Plattsburgh? You know, I mean, because this is prior to, you know, really the Millerite movement obviously taking off. Um, so, you know, you don't have a Sunday law at that time. You have the, the beast has received a deadly wound. So is there something about the end and the beginning being connected in some way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because this, this is typifying something that happens later, 9-11. And the question is, how do we understand that typification? Well, as, as we break this down, we're able to see at this moment three legs. We're mm -hmm. seeing we, we can we can make the application of 911 between the years 419 and 538, where the the Roman church is coming into ascendancy. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I find it intriguing that within a period of roughly, I don't say exactly, but roughly 70 years, we have Islam beginning to arise. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that that they place the beginning of the Islamic rule as beginning in what, 606 AD? Yeah, yeah, that's where they place it on the chart, 606. Though I, I'm not able to find an event that happens then, but yeah, so 606. Okay, so... After that point, Islam, again, is, is being raised up to offer levels of protection for God's people. Uh -huh. Now, 
I, I have found it interesting in going through some of the pioneer writings that there were those that were reliant on other commentators where these commentators were trying to state that for their time that Britain was the king of the north and France the king of the south. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was definitely a view held back then. So in, in this thought process, this would be for those commentators, the king of the north, Britain, coming against what some were coming to call the glorious land, the yeah. United States, but they never did overflow it. They never were able to take control of it. Mm -hmm. But yet, as we're looking at this in notebook number one, using these those verses from Daniel, he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Well, the United States is not Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So while the British did enter also into America, what countries were overthrown? Canada was not overthrown because Canada was part of the empire. Yeah. France was finally defeated, but only for a time. But Daniel eleven sixteen, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. We cannot make that application to Britain against the United States. No. Uh, if we attempt to, we are doing damage to that verse. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're setting aside Miller's rules. Yeah. Yeah, it, it becomes, okay, here, here's a, a point. Um, you know, when we look at the beast of Revelation 13 and the beast of Revelation 17, and also the beast of Revelation 12, you know, the way that we often have applied it is we see them as the same beast, um, sort of in different manifestations. Um, and, and one of the ways that we can tell that they're, that they're different times is in chapter 12, the seven heads have the crowns. There's seven crowns on the seven heads. In chapter 13, there's crowns upon uh, the horns. And in chapter 17, they don't have any crowns, right? And sometimes when we're trying to look at these, these different histories, we can see that there are some parallels, but there's also differences. And um, when it comes to all the battles of the kings of the north and the kings of the south, we have different representations of them. We have, some of them are civil wars. So we have the civil war in, uh, Isaiah chapter seven and eight. Well, that civil war, the king of the north is, is northern Israel. The king of the south is Judah. Um, but you have, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11. That's Syria and Egypt. Um, but we also have, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south in the United States in that civil war. So, and, and you know, we could look at... You, you know, as, as you're talking about here, you know, seeing, well, Britain is the king of the north or whatever. Well, it doesn't apply prophetically, but there still are parallels that you could get from history regarding the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. You just wouldn't make an application of prophecy there. Does, does that make sense? Okay. You know, because you can see. Uh, I mean, if, if, if the United States is the king of the South, it wins this battle. 
against all odds. You know, you, you could connect it that way. But we are connecting it to 9-11, but we wouldn't say that Islam is the king of the South just because Islam comes against the United States. But there, there is still some parallels you can make between these different types of events. Um, but you just can't make it a prophetic application, which is a different thing altogether. So I, I think what we have to do is we have to recognize that what Uriah Smith is doing is, is incorrect in how he's trying to apply these verses. And, and he's taking, um, you know, if you go to Uriah Smith, what he's doing uh, with his statement, um, you know, he's dealing with the glorious land here. And, and, and I think his point is, um, you know, to deal with the Jews and the Romans. But he's not trying to address the same point that Jeff is, that the glorious land is the United States. But we would have to see that that is typical. Whatever happens in Daniel 11, verse 16 is typical because we've made this application that Daniel 11, the history in connection with this prophecy, will be repeated. Now, just another point, too. When it says here, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. What does this remind us of in Daniel chapter 11? Like, who is, who is pagan Rome typifying here? Anybody? Papal Rome. And, and, and so what verse specifically in Daniel 11 would this be referring to if, if Uriah Smith had actually seen this properly? How would he have interpreted uh, verse 36? I think it is. Because verse 36, and it says, the king shall do according to his will. So who does Uriah Smith make that to be? Yeah, France. Okay. France, Napoleon. Right, so it has to be papal Rome. So what's happening in verse 16 is pagan Rome coming into the glorious land. He shall stand in the glorious land. And he shall do according to his own will. Well, that's, that's typifying what happens in Daniel 11, verse 36. And so that king that does according to his own will has to be papal Rome. It can't be France, right? Now, of course, you know, we have a lot of hindsight based upon all of this as we're studying it and God's leading of his church and this movement. But Jeff himself here, I don't think he fully understands what he's saying as he's doing this reference, because he's just trying to argue that the glorious land is the United States. And so he's not He's not recognizing the parallel, even within the book of Daniel itself. Um, so here, when he's talking about the glorious land, well, that's the land of Israel, and the land of Israel is going to typify the United States. But then he's not really thinking about who Rome is typifying. Pagan Rome is typifying papal Rome. He's not thinking about that. Um, but neither is Uriah Smith. We now can look at this differently. We can see some things that they couldn't see. Um, so we covered that sufficiently to know that we, we still have to think about it. There's still quite a bit to be considered. Yeah, it, there's a lot to think about. Um, and then Jeff's going to quote from Prophets and Kings, verse 16, God brought his chosen people out of the land of Egypt. So the land of Egypt is the south, right? That he might bring them to 
to a good land, a land which in his providence he had prepared for them as a refuge from their enemies. He would bring them to himself and encircle them in his everlasting arms. And in return for his goodness and mercy, they were to exalt his name and make it glorious in the earth. Now, Jeff, again, is presenting this because he's showing that the land of Israel is the glorious land and it's typical of the United States. But what does it mean that God brought his chosen people out of the land of Egypt? Because Egypt is the king of the south. How do we understand that as a symbol? Why the land of Egypt? Wasn't this, could, could we not make this as a, a symbol of God's people being hidden, even though they are surrounded by pagan thought and pagan practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also you got Egypt, uh, because at the end, Egypt is going to come back, right? Right. Egypt is is this satanic power, this atheism, and it's going to invade the United States as well, right? Is that how we're seeing it? That the United, that the King of the South is gonna come against the King of the North again. So this King of the South came against the King of the North, the papacy in 1798. And the King of the North came, you know, with the United States and overthrew the Soviet Union. But we now see that we can take this history and make a further application of this history being repeated and that the king of the south will once again come against the king of the north. But this time it's atheism coming against the United States. And, and so this is the religion of Egypt has always tried to undo the religion of God, of God's people. Right, Egypt has always been this um, satanic attack against true worship, and and Egypt, you know, symbolizes its atheism, but it's really a type of paganism. Right. Okay, so. Now we know we have these other symbols. We have Babylon as a symbol as well. And how does Babylon differ from the symbol of Egypt? Uh, at the beginning, you're thinking geographically but then also the teachings of Babylon moved to different nations, to Rome. Okay. So what are the teachings of Babylon? How do they differ from the teachings of Egypt? I mean, they're both pagan. Good question. Anybody with thoughts on that? Well, the teachings of Egypt, if we, if we look at how these teachings are being expressed by their leader, Pharaoh of Egypt made the comment to Moses, who is God? Mm -hmm. Now, the situation in Babylon was here was Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan, but he was willing to accept the pronouncements of Daniel and of his friends because Daniel was able to interpret the dreams, but the friends came through a an experience right in front of Nebuchadnezzar where if they had no faith, they would have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, 
the king of Egypt was being shown multiple ways mm -hmm. of God's power, but all the way through, he was refusing to accept that this power was greater than the power of his of his servants. So Nebuchadnezzar, though not of the children of Israel, though born as a pagan, was willing to accept God's leadership in his life, and Pharaoh never was willing to accept this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, when you look at, at Babylon, I mean, there's there's much more similarity, even though one's pagan and, and you have God's people, there's much more similarity between the religion of Babylon and the religion of the Jews. That is, it's it's a it has some similarities, right? We'll just put it that way. I'm not going to go into all the different similarities and differences, but it it tends to have more a form of the type of worship that we see in Israel. Where when you look at the worship of Egypt, it's very, um, I mean, both are mystical. Babylon is mystical and so forth. But just the multiplicity of gods, um, Egypt is way more superstitious in, in, its, uh, in, in an elaborate way uh, regarding, um, you know, religion. Also, the Egyptians' belief in the immortal soul, um, the immortality, what happens when you die, the way they treat their dead, is very different from Babylon. Babylon has a much more, um, I'll say, earthy kind of way of looking at religion than, than the Egyptians did. I mean, these are kind of really simplifications, but... Um, the worship of Egypt is, is more satanic in a direct way than the religion of Babylon, which one of the reasons that Daniel could reach Nebuchadnezzar is that he could sort of reach him on that level of just seeing that that, that God of Israel is the true God, where there is sort of this competition of gods in Babylon. There isn't really the competition of gods in Egypt. There, I mean, there are obviously they battle against each other and there's these different forces of, of nature, but it's just different. I, I, I don't know how to explain it uh, um, without going into detail. But um, I mean, because there are some similarities between Babylon and Egypt as well. That, they both are distortions of, of true worship in some way. But in Egypt is farther away than Babylon is in that context of, of what true worship is. Um, paganism, the paganism of Babylon is a counterfeit of God's earthly sanctuary, where you don't have the, the same type of worship in Egypt. Um, so, but I think the point that you're making there that there is this, that Nebuchadnezzar comes to accept the God of the Israelites and even his role, even the fact that, that Babylon is given that control over the land of Israel. Egypt never has that type of control. The Jews are never in bondage to Egypt after they leave Egypt. They are at times, you know, paying tribute to, to Egypt, but Babylon comes and controls the Levant, uh, you know, for 70 years. Egypt never does that. So, so God has a purpose for Babylon as a symbol that is different from the pur purpose of Egypt. So when it comes to this idea of what's happening now in the United States, where we have, uh, We'll say it's the king of the south, you know, globalism, atheism has infected the United States. Um, it's going to be different when we see 
uh, the papacy in control of the United States. I, I don't know if I'm expressing myself too well, because these are just some ideas. Um, so, so let's look at a little bit more. Let's read this next statement from Selected Messages, book one, page 92. Is it in vain that the declaration of eternal truth has been given to this nation to be carried to all the nations of the world? God has chosen a people and made them the repositories of truth, weighty with eternal results. To them has been given the light that must illuminate the world. Has God made a mistake? Are we indeed his choose, chosen in, instrumentalities? Are we the men and women who are to bear to the world the messages of Revelation 14, to proclaim the message of salvation to those who are standing on the brink of ruin? Do we act as if we were? Um, so this is a, is a good question. So we can see that ancient Israel has the same role that the United States has. Was ancient Israel able to convert the Pharaoh? No, they were not able to convert the Pharaoh. Were they able to convert the king of Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar, yes. Belshazzar, no. Yeah, so Nebuchadnezzar, yes. Belshazzar, no. Um, but they were able to convert a king of Babylon and particularly the one that God put into power uh, to rule, you know, for the larger part of those 70 years. Well, the, the, the point was that Nebuchadnezzar was given examples and he saw these events that occurred before his eyes and he experienced prophecy in his own life. Mm -hmm. Belshazzar was given the opportunity. He was shown and saw the experience that Nebuchadnezzar went through, but he did not choose to accept this as being important within his life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when, yeah. So when we look at um, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, and we look at the Sunday law, so he shall also enter into the glorious land, that's going to be, who's the he that enters into the glorious land? King of the North. King of the North. So this is the papacy. And many shall be overthrown. So he's going to overthrow many. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So in the United States, there are some that going, are going to escape the hand of the papacy. But when, he, when the papacy stretched forth his hand upon the countries, it says, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. That is, Egypt itself, atheism, is not going to escape the hand. Right. Yeah. So, so that tells you the difference between the papacy, or I mean, between uh, atheism and Protestantism. And Protestantism being the king of the being connected with the king of the north, the king of the north comes in and takes over the United States, enters into the glorious land. But some escape out of his hand. And we, we say these are symbols of Protestantism, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Um, because they're the glorious land is is God's uh, the country that God has chosen, which is the land of Israel. Um, so in studying this Sunday law, I mean, there's there's lots that we're going to have to look at because we know that um, that in 1997, 1998, uh, they're looking for this coming Sunday law, and 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 what's going to happen instead of the Sunday law is going to be 9/11, and so what I'm going to try to show over the next number of studies is is how they look at this Sunday law and if we go back to this uh, uh, this article from August 1998 which which I'm going to read there's not a lot here uh, it's not like a long article but we'll start reading this next week and, and I'm going to grab some other things as well 
So here's just a short, short little article. Um, but their focus is going to be uh, the Sunday law that's coming, right? So that's the focus. It's, it's very parallel with what Adventists are thinking. So when 9-11 happens, that's what we really want to understand is how this movement addressed 9-11 and how it was different than anyone else. And it was because of the foundation that was laid uh, from 1989 to 9-11 that this movement was then able to understand this. Now, if you remember a few years ago, Parminder started to introduce uh, a type of history of this movement. And in doing so, the thing is, he put the, put the history of this movement on a line, but he didn't really address what the movement was teaching. That is, if he had done it properly, we would never would have accepted Parminder's, the way that he's, he's thinking now. Uh, we would have seen, because Parminder was very deceitful, he, he tried to use the history of this movement while rejecting its teachings. And, and, and because people weren't familiar with the understanding of this message, and, and Jeff pointed this out, uh, you know, in 19, 2019, that, that basically they had, they had taken that they accept the time of the end magazine, but they had actually rejected everything in it. And, and you can see that, that as we've, we looked at the time of the end magazine, that the foundation there does not allow for the ideas that are being uh, promoted by the Omega. Uh, because this idea of the threefold union, um, the Omega teaches that the Catholic Church is good. This is a good Pope. Uh, so they reject the whole idea of the threefold union, which is really the basic premise of the Time of the End magazine, is that you're going to have this threefold union bringing about the Sunday law. And of course, the new movement rejects the idea of the Sunday law completely. That it's just being about, you know, uh, homosexuals and um, and blacks. So anyway, we're going to stop there for today. Um, there's, I forgot to hit share. So that's um, this article here we're going to read uh, to start tomorrow. And um, yeah, I appreciate uh Dwight, the things that you're saying here, because they bring in some questions that we're going to have to address. Uh, sorting out, I think that history uh, after 1798, so when we look at the history of the time of the end in Millerite history, and we start to parallel it with our history, uh, I think that we, we've we never, we, we look at August 11th, 1840 as paralleling 9-11 but we fail to understand the role of September 11th, uh, 1814. And, I, and I, I, I want to address this because I'm going to go back over a history um, that I'm a part of in this movement dealing with 1993. And I think that we can see a parallel between 1993 with the first attack on the World Trade Center with what happened um, on September 11th, 1814. So, so we'll, we'll look at that at some point. Anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study this morning. Uh, as we have more things to understand, uh, more things to study, uh, we just pray, Lord, that you can help us in our personal study to sort through these difficulties and ideas that are coming up. Help us to be faithful in the little things that you ask us to do each day. And be with us throughout this day and bring us together again to study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.